Okay, brethren, greetings and apparitions. Now I say this and because I'm recording this during the Halloween season here in 2024, where we look at, I look around the neighborhood here, when I say apparitions, these are like spooky images or things that appear, disappear, all these things that surround the, the season of Halloween. By the time you see this recording, it will be a couple of days after, but this is the, the, the uh, secular season that we're in. So I'm using that as a, a start. And uh, so thank you for joining us here for Shepherd's Voice magazine and for this premiere edition. Anytime you want to happen to see this, this video after, this message after. So we're in the Halloween season, and I'm using that as a, a way to kick off. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, there's lots of stuff being put on yards. I see it right next door. Even they're, they, these are they're they're uh, orthodox in their in their religion too. But I see a lot of these things in the neighborhood. They got these tombstones, skeletons, and things like that. Um, spider webs, uh, huge spiders. Uh, you know, and a lot of the new fancy electronics now. I went for a walk one night last year and I almost jumped out of my pants because I just walked by a yard that was full of these scary things and then as soon as it senses somebody walking by it, it just, <laughs> it just goes into action. So it's different. Now goblins don't scare me and I don't presume they scare you either. But I just want to get right into the content here. But there are some, let's just say, scriptures that might spook me a little bit. There are some, you know. And, or maybe they used to. And maybe there's some that maybe spook you a little bit as well. But let's not be afraid here. Let's not be afraid of this. And I want to take us to a, what I would call, a very spooky scripture. And this scripture has been considered one of the more disturbing scriptures in the Bible. No, we're getting all serious here, aren't we? <laughs> Relax, relax, just, you know, just, just work with me here on this a little bit. And I'm sure you can think of one yourself. Just think if we can take a pause here, just maybe I could stop talking, but, I, but really I, would, I don't want to do, necessarily do that. But perhaps there's some scriptures that give you pause in the Bible. There's probably one or a few or two. I mean, there's, what does it say? Uh, this is the one on whom I look, who trembles at my word. And there are things that um, we tremble, maybe tremble at, because we we see this as what God orated and gave to the people that wrote the scriptures, something for us to consider. So I want to think of this one scripture that I'm going to focus on on today. And I know that some of you might be putting up maybe walls of resistance. There's some very some of us get very fundamental. Well, there's no there's no scriptures. They're all perfect. There's nothing spooky about them. They're all perfect. Yeah, they're, they're perfect. But spooky means unnerving. And some of the scriptures maybe are given to, you know, rouse us up a little bit, maybe a little bit unnerving for us, or causes us to consider and think a lot more about ourselves and our relationship with God and relationship with each other. So it's, it's very real. This is all very real to us. All this stuff in the neighborhood and these things floating around and pumpkins and, and just, this, they're getting more imaginative with this kind of stuff lately. Uh, you know, it's, we know it isn't real and really doesn't matter and, it, and giving a sermon about Halloween is a waste of time, to be honest with you. Um, but it's very real when we think about these scriptures. Maybe you're thinking of one of, or two. What about this one? This one might be Spooky. This one might be a little bit something that would grab our attention is Luke 12, verse 5. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Well, that's, that's something to, that's a very sobering scripture. There's none of, you know, alcohol in the world that can deal with that reality. But that's very sobering. But that is something we know that he does not take any pleasure in. That the wicked should perish, or perish altogether, especially his beloved. 
under any circumstances. But we know that he doesn't, he, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So what might be a scripture that we may think is spooky, but he does take pleasure in? That's the one we're going to go and focus in on today. And I wonder, I'm wondering, it's one of the more disturbing scriptures in the Bible, as some consider it. And we're going to go there. So we've got to put our brave front on here and go to that scripture and, uh, and see what's really going on. What's really going on with this? And it's in Math, it's a Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5. And you will know where I'm going with this perhaps before I think, maybe before I get there, which is perfectly fine. All right? You have heard it said, in verse 43, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son, his son, rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Then comes one of the most discouraging words, perhaps for, for many. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Woo. Or boo. He sure came out of that. Let's repeat that. Therefore, you shall be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. There is a show on Canadian TV. I think it got into Michigan for a while. I think it was Frankenstein's Hilarious House of Horrors or something like that. And the librarian uh, would come in and he was very old and crotchety and he would just sit down and tell, try to tell a spooky story. And when he failed to do so, he said, well, I'll get you next time. <laughs> uh, I think that's the name of the, 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 the thing, of the, uh, of the show. And it was like, uh, in Canada, it was like basically the, if you were growing up in the 70s or 80s, you had to know about this thing. And the librarian always failed to spook anybody. And he says, I'll get you next time. And then he would fall asleep. <laughs> Johnny Van Zandt, I think, was <laughs> he played all these characters. Uh, I can't, just can't help to make the reference. But, now, one would say, well, no, I don't think that's discouraging, Jim. Jim, uh, we should be perfect. Well, you know, some people don't really see it that way. And it's, it's a difficult scripture. It truly is. I'm not speaking just for myself. It's, it's just for everyone to be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And there's ways that people have worked their way around it, but I'm going to shut that down in a little bit. You know, in 2 Corinthians, this, this term, the same term, perfect. Okay, we're going to get a little technical for a second, but if you don't mind. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, um, Paul says here, and it's concluding, concluding remarks, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be, be perfect. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and God of love and peace shall be with you. Now when Paul was thinking about perfect here, the same term that is being used, he's not thinking about the kingdom future. He's, th he's told him to be comforted now. You know, be of good comfort. Someday, in the millennium, no, he's talking to be perfect. He's sort of putting it to them now. So be perfect now. And when Jesus was talking about being perfect in the kingdom, he's not talking being perfect. He's not talking about being perfect in the kingdom either. He expresses that expectation now in this ex this expression. He's talking about it now or as soon as possible. And there's no playing around with the Greek tenses in this phrase to make it come out as though he's saying someday you'll be perfect. Just be patient. I mean, yeah, there's patience involved here, especially God's patience. 
but he's talking about a very real time thing. So what does it mean to be perfect in the sense of the Greek word here that has been given? Right? And having reached its end, complete, perfect. And the usage is a complete in all parts, full grown, of full age, especially of the completeness of the Christian character. Wow. That's a, that's a big expectation. That is a big expectation. Does it mean to be flawless in every way? Absolutely flawless. No mistakes. No issues. No, nothing going on with you at all. You should be perfect. No shadow of turning. There's nothing, anything, any bits of problems with you at all. Flawless. Is that what he's go, is going for here? Now, when it term and and from the human point of view, let's say that, even from our our point of view, perfection. Um, to us, uh, it does flawless. When there's somebody talks to me, yeah, that's perfect. That's perfection. We're talking about. Flawlessness. Flawlessness. No mistakes. No mistakes in execution. Nothing. Whatever it is. And that must make this very, this scripture somewhat ominous from the human perspective. Knowing what we're like. If we're just honest with ourselves. And we're going to go into some more honesty. So perhaps right now you might find these undeniable words of Jesus Christ a little bit, I hate to use the term, spooky. Just for the sake of the time. Now why? Why would we, why would we be, might be intimidated by such a scripture? And again, don't throw up your defenses. I'm not intimidated by anything Jesus Christ said. Oh, I think it's a good thing to be <laughs> intimidated. You know, tremble at his word. That's something, that's something that I think a characteristic we don't ever really want to lose. We need to be confident, though, in the same, in the same vein. And confident in what he's saying. Because he wouldn't say this expectation if it were impossible. At the at, in the real time. So let's talk about this some more. Again, we're having a little journey here. We're having a little discussion. You know, we find a little spooky. Why? Well, because this. Here's and this. Maybe you can relate to this, and then you know, just give me. I need some rope going along here. My experience in the last 25 years seems, to, and you know, I was baptized in 1999, last century. Maybe that makes it longer. But my experience in the last 20 years seems to hold on to a lot of memories of all the imperfections and all the flaws I've encountered in the brethren and groups as a whole. I can't escape that. I've seen a lot, and perhaps and probably and almost assuredly so have you. Just seen all kinds of stuff that would resemble everything that is flawed. And then when I look in that mirror, every morning, we have what in Canada is called an ensuite, but the, you know, it's like a, in the United States, they, you know, I don't know what they call it here. You know, I can go from my bedroom right to the, to the bathroom and I can look in that mirror. What do I see? When I look in that mirror, I see a flawed person. I know my flaws. And I look in that mirror, and James kind of always reminds us there, you know, seeing ourselves, looking at the reflection in the mirror. I don't know what kind of mirrors they had back then, but these ones are, the ones we have now, are probably much better. And I see myself, and I see myself, um, it, you know, flawed. I see a flawed person. And I'm, when I'm recording this message on the camera there, you know, I put a jacket on and, you know, shave and clean up a bit for for this, but I'm incredibly flawed. I see a flawed person. And I'm speaking to flawed people too. There is absolutely no doubt about this in my mind. 
And I think about all that one has experienced <clears throat> and witnessed. And I've seen just about all kinds of nasty comments uh, between brethren, fighting and accusations. And all these false ideas of God and just the brutally bad theology, a lot of it which, which we have flagged up here on this channel over the last several years that Darren and I have done. I'm not patting myself or patting Darren on the back at all. Because a lot of this stuff we used to believe. Incredibly flawed beginnings and hopefully we, we are overcoming a lot of these false teachings. And Darren has gone to a lot of this lately in his exploration of Galatians, which has been very particularly helpful for me. It was Galatians and Paul. Paul, in general, I always have a hard time <laughs> understanding. And all the stupidity in within the assemblies of God that I have known. <clears throat> the lack of forgiveness. The indifference the emotional manipu manipulation, all these mechanisms of control that have been implemented, all of that express such a flawed people. So this is why this scripture is somewhat, again, if you excuse the term, rather spooky for me. At least for a while. Especially when I look in the mirror. Now all this sounds very negative. And in some sense, when I put these, uh, when I was putting these notes together, I was thinking about all the rather negative sermons that I hear over the years. Heard a lot of positive ones too that are very encouraging. And I'm trying to, I am going there with this, brethren. I am going somewhere encouraging for us we got to start somewhere. This is where I've started. This is an imperfect message. Imperfect. I'm sure there's a lot better ways of presenting it. But I'm, gonna get, I'm, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing what I can. There's sometimes these, these negative sermons say, well, we're not doing enough as a people. We need to be doing more of this and this and that and the other. And maybe that's true. Uh, there is corrective messages in, in the New Testament. They're given to us. And there's things that our nation is in decline. We're departing from God and we need to worry about this kind of stuff. Well, that's not the calling at all. And we've gone through some great lengths on this program or this channel to say, to pull away from this kind of stuff and stop getting into the secular issues because that's all it is. It's all temporal here. America's temporal. And there's nothing, there's no calling whatsoever in the New Testament of the brethren to, to save a nation. There is nothing there at all. Or spend time running around and pro protesting abortion clinics and all these kinds of things. Uh, that is not there. Some believe it to be there calling, you know, but it's just it's simply not there. And perhaps one can point a finger at me or at Darren. We focused a lot on false deceptive teaching that have infiltrated God's people. And that's true. I mean, it's true. I mean, <laughs> though that's, that's also very much a focus in the New Testament writings. So there is an ongoing challenge, an ongoing battle, and we're a part of it. God and Darren and so many others you know, have been called to deal with this kind of stuff. But I don't want you to walk away from this message feeling spooked or annoyed with any negative talk. We're going to go, we're going to end up on a positive note here, and I need you to give me the rope to allow us to take us there. Because we're talking about a scripture here, that you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that's a big deal. It's right there. It comes from Jesus Christ's mouth on the Sermon on the Mount. So how do we start? Let's just start, start turning this around a little bit. Start turning this around so we can understand what Christ's and the Father's expectations here. I don't think it is possible 
Nor is the expectation of Jesus Christ that we are meant here. What is meant being what is being meant here by the scripture I've read, and we're going to revisit it again, is that we should be looking at ourselves uh, from our perspective and see perfection. That I should look in the mirror and see perfection. So again, I don't think it's possible, nor is it the expectation of Jesus Christ or the Father or the Father or anything holy, anything holy, and the twenty-four elders in the heaven the Son is meant here that we should be looking, trying to find a way to look at ourselves from our perspective and see perfection in the mirror and expect everyone else to look at us, to see the, the, the world, and even other brethren to see us as someone who is perfected. I don't see that. If anyone does, it's just, it's just be real here. Let's just it's be real. If anyone does, that indicates that they have blind spots. And I know of these situations, now situations, there's some blind spots. And those who are, have these blind spots are always the most offended anyway. You know, how dare you? How dare you offend me when you committed so many other offenses? <laughs> you know, take the plank out of your own eye, right? And as those who see themselves as somewhat perfected will sit in the seat of the scornful right there in Psalm 1. We don't want that. What I believe, if we're going to interpret that scripture properly, it must come from the eyes of the Father in heaven and how he sees us and how he sees sinners and how he looks upon the world. That is the perspective that is the perspective I think Jesus Christ is going for. Because I just can't imagine myself ever thinking, saying that I have arrived and looking at myself in the mirror and seeing perfection. I don't think Apostle Paul did. He did everything he, he could in his situation. And he was a unique character in history. They still studied and debated and and there's a lot of controversy surrounding that man still to this day. You know, but he admits, you know, I think when he says he, he had a flaw, and people debate what that flaw was, this thorn in his flesh, is Jesus Christ, my, <laughs> my grace is, you know, my, um, my strength is made perfect in, Weakness. Someone paraphrasing that. So I don't think it's possible. That's not what he meant here. To come to say you need to come to some recognition of your own perfection. That didn't doesn't say that. It's got to come from the eyes of the Father in heaven. In fact, there is a school of thought, and I believe it. It's what are flaws that bring people together more than our greatest attributes or our perfections. It's our flaws that bring people together. Because in reality, if you've talked to psychologists and therapists, they recognize it a lot better than we do. They see people and all their flaws and all their vulnerabilities and all their frailties they come to them trying to navigate life. And I've talked to them, and they will tell you that. We are flawed, human beings are very flawed in a flawed world, in a fallen world, maybe let's put it that way. And Jesus Christ came as that light to show us the way out in a one way ticket. The reality is, flawed. But again, it's our flaws that bring people together. What did James say in verse 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 16 of his 
of his writing. Confess your faults to one another. It doesn't say confess your perfections to one another so that they do better and have, can learn from your wonderful attributes to show them just how it's done. No, it just says confess your faults to one another and pray for one another regarding their faults, regarding all the issues that they're facing, all the imperfections. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So this is one thought. It's the consideration of someone else praying for somebody else regarding their imperfections. So this is very real. And I wondered, you know, when you look at Jesus Christ, <clears throat> you know, he says, you know, Jesus Christ had to suffer a kind of, I call it sinless imperfection. He was sinless, but he was a human being. He came here in order to be our Savior. It's perhaps the worst suffering imaginable to be sinless and then suffer the human condition somehow. I don't know. I can't fully express it. But he had to experience our limitations as, as a human. He had to divest himself of his glory to come down and be in this situation. And that's a bigger deal maybe than ever we can possibly imagine. So we have to have faith in this, in this death, burial, and resurrection, and the righteous life that he lived in his teachings. It's, just, it's the only way. Nobody's, nobody's ever suggested a better way to me <laughs> when it comes down to the reality. He even said, why do you even call me good to that rich young ruler? Why are you a good teacher? And, and there's a lot of discussion on that. But why do you call me good? Only your father in heaven is good. He deferred to his father. I want to go to Matthew 9. Again, we're kind of just collecting some thoughts here. You know, I'm not trying to segue into things very, very uh, perfectly, if you don't mind the, the comment. But Matthew 9, and verse 9, he says here, As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax, at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now it happened that Jesus sat at the table in the house, I think this is Matthew's home, I believe, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The most, one of the most flawed, flawed people around. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well need uh, no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. There is perfection in that statement, by the way. To desire mercy or to have the heart of mercy over even sacrifice, as they understood it. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, as somewhat of a sidebar here, if, I, if you go back to some of the earlier discussions we've had on this channel, some get confused over this statement, For I have not come all call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. People assume it's the self-righteous. No. He's talking about repentance, which means to change one thinking. It's not for penance. It's just an English word or translation from Latin. To, it's a very bad translation. My friend Tracy French has talked about this a lot. He, when it comes to repentance, it's a change of thinking, to a renewal of the mind, to go another direction, to see things differently, and to act and behave more accordingly. When John the Baptist says, you know, the, the, the tax collector, don't take more than you should and treat people rightly to the, to the centurion. This is change your thinking because the king is here and you want to get in his favor. The righteous already in his favor. That's what he means here. So he went to and got to, went to the, a place they went to where they were. He's not going to reject sinners. 
you went to them. Because they're the ones that need help. And that's what he did. When he's talking about the righteous, the righteous don't need as much help as the sinners. And that's the attitude we need to take as well. Because the righteous are already in God's favor. I'm not talking they're saved or anything. It still takes Jesus Christ's intervention, death, burial, and resurrection. But they were in already in God's favor. Because they're always they're already looking for hope and salvation in God. But that's just sort of a, a side thing. And I, I reason why I think about this is because I brought it up in a Bible studying group one time online. And um, we were talking about various subjects. And I said, well, what about going to a bar and talking to people about God there or, you know, just giving some new ideas and, and uh, maybe sharing elements of the gospel there. Or if people ask you what you do, well, uh, you know, minister and I do this and that and the other. At a bar, of all places, a bar. And the comment was, well, I don't, there was a comment by one individual on that study, which I have, you know, very good, nice person, nothing to take away from her. He says, well, th these people aren't looking for God. These people are there, are not there to listen to, well, who are we to say? Who are we to say and make that prejudgment on anyone? We need to be careful of that. And this, this scripture speaks to that itself. Don't dismiss groups of people, if at all possible. Don't prejudge. You know, it's like, you know, I was talking about, <laughs> flawed people have a way of coming together. What about Darren? Darren Connery, well, he's a flawed guy too. Just like me. You know, what sort of more brings us together and doing this program together is that we recognize each other's flaws. And we've talked a little bit about this. And we go to where each other are. I've gone to where Darren is. He's had a different experience than me, but I went to where he was. And where he is, but where he was, maybe, where he was. To try to understand and relate to what's going on. And he's done the same with me, and I'm very grateful for that, because he sees all my imperfections, many as many as we've talked about. But that brings, but our flaws bring us together, and we talk about them. We need to do this more often with each other, and I have that same relationship with others. People getting together and just, just touting their perfections and their great understandings of God's word. And how the world needs to get to know God, and like I do, and that's God's laws they need to follow, and not really understanding what they're talking about. And um, taking this high-level approach, you know, in Bible discussions, just over, just this, this, this high, <laughs> this too high a level uh, approach, of admitting no fault in any of, the, any of these things, unless it's superficially, yeah, you know. And I sometimes experiment with that. I, honestly, I say, yeah, I really screwed that up. I overdue judgmental, and that's been true. And that's been true. And it works well. Flawed people, when they sincerely get together in sincerity, not looking for that, what they call a loose brick, to find something on somebody. And I've seen that kind of behavior before. And that's why it says, don't cast your pearls before swine. But that's all another diversion. And even Paul says, you know, not many wise or noble are called, but he called the despised of the world. And God is doing this to make a point, because he saw this way in advance. And when you think about it all in more an encompassing way, in First Peter chapter 4, and verse 8, Above all, maintain an intense love for each other, since love covers a multitude of sins. That's on the way to perfection. In another sense, 
it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse, let's start here. Well, I can go to verse 6. I'm going to go there for the sake of time so I don't lose, lose you. He says, How be it we speak wisdom among that are perfect, being you guys, you Corinthians. They're not perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princesses, the princes of this world that have come to naught. You know, this same word, perfect, that Christ used here is often translated mature. The term in Greek often does occur in a relative sense as it does here, according to my research. So that are perfect in a relative sense. Because then he goes on to say later, I think in chapter chapter 3, well, there's some that are not as mature as others. So there's a relative sense. But the sense is those who are perfect are those who recognize their place in the world and their place in God and what God is doing. And that he is to be glorified. And a lot of these things, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've tried my best you know, to communicate them and they do hold with some... <laughs> when they recognize we're here for God's glory. And that's a big step for some. Some are still stuck in this idea that God is here for us or, or God came to save sinners and all these kinds of things. And he did. There's a, there's a lot of elements to that. But to understand this in, as a totality is to understand that God is doing this for himself. And because he's doing it for himself, we get blessed by it. We get caught up in it and we're brought along with it. So it's perfect. It's a perfect thing. And it's a perfect thing to understand. To me, it's perfection. Understanding that is perfection for somebody just to grab a hold of that, to see God's perfection and to grasp that perfection and just appreciate it and love it for the truth that it is. And that's a big deal because it made a big difference for me. But in the sense of Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus Christ said perfect, it is not relative. It's not being relative. It does, does mean perfect. But it, brethren, listen to this closely. But it doesn't mean technically perfect. It does not mean technically perfect. And it occurred to me today as writing these notes just exactly what I mean by that because I knew I was going to say it and then I, and then I realized what, how far, that, how important that point is I think I'm making. I don't think God is technically perfect either. Whoa, what, what? The Father God, creator of all things, holy, I don't think is technically perfect. Because technical perfection would limit his perfection by his own nature, which is love. And I know what technical means, being an engineer. But technically perfect, no. Technically perfection would mean, by definition, okay, is in regard to or in accordance with a strict little inter literal interpretation of something. That meets the specification. Exactly. Because I deal with that world of specifications all the time. And even that gets messed around with. Is that the God we worship? When he created man, he said it was very good. Perfection, I think, was yet to come. But you look at history, God doesn't deal with us in a technical manner that would limit his ability. I've seen machines, and there's machines design, and it just works technically perfect, punching out things. And it's been tested and tried, and it's technically perfect. 
It's flawless. It does what it's supposed to do until it breaks down. And everything breaks down. Every machine that I've ever heard of and known of needs maintenance. It just doesn't keep working. And God does not work with a strict, literal interpretation of something. I just don't see that in his nature. For God is love. So let's go back to Matthew 5. Let's just kind of go back there and see if I can find it here in my, in my notes. <clears throat> Matthew 5. Let's go back and just revisit this thing and more contextually. I'm not going to go through all of Matthew 5 because it all plays in here. Let's go back there and see this again based on what I've been talking about. And by no means, again, as I process this message, as I, I'm talking about it, I wonder if I'm really making the point fair and balanced um, for us as to what Jesus Christ expectation was. But again, it's in the eyes of the Father, and we're going to revisit that in just a second. You have heard it said, in verse 43, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Not even, you know, it says that God loves those who don't love him. Do you not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet the brethren only, what do you more what do you do more than others? When God greets the sinner. Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What he's saying here in a collective sense is find a way to love over and across a broad area and across a broad range of flaws of people, etc. It means to be even-handed. And love covers a multitude of sins. We can't forget this. Being even-handed being even and dealing with people. A technical Strict interpretation of righteousness or perfection can lead to ruin and will hurt a lot of people. If God only loved those who loved him, a lot of people would be hurt unnecessarily. A lot of people wouldn't be get rain and, the, and there's somehow he's wanted to send a storm cloud through and he says, just only rain on the righteous. That's not what he does. He's, all the, the righteous and unrighteous get rained on. So if he said, I just want it to rain on the righteous, then it wouldn't, it, it, that's not how it works. Because he just described his father's attitude, expectations here. For if you love those who love you, that's, that's all, that's so limited, it's so technical. So a technical, strict Interpretation of righteousness or perfection can just absolutely lead to ruin. And that's not God's expectations. The obsessive compulsive disorder people would be also would be have this problem, would be in danger, and there's <laughs> and that's very real. Because I do believe, as we talked about, this Hebrew roots movement indulges those seeking a technical perfection. Looking at all the laws and working it all out. Making sure and making make sure others understand all these things. It's unsustainable. And that's not God's expectation of us. Now I've alluded earlier this. Perfection is in the eyes, or beauty, as they say, is in the eyes of the beholder. And perfection is in the eyes of the beholder. Because this is coming from God's point of view. Isn't that what I said? Something to that effect. I've already forgotten it because I'm trying to push this through. Because if you look in the mirror and say, oh, I see perfection. 
That's not what God is asking us to, to do here. It's from his perspective. In the eyes of the beholder. The Father knows our flaws. And where we've come from and all the circumstances that have surrounded our past and our present, our past sins and the screw-ups, the misgivings, the wrong doctrinal ideas and... You know, we've talked about that, and Darren has talked about this too. You know, uh, we've got to appreciate Darren's candid, candid being so candid, you know, about what he used to teach, and now he doesn't teach it anymore. Because he realizes this, and this is growth. And I, I feel the same way about myself. It's like, what was I believing before? So I was just being naive, I don't know. But that's that's Okay. You know, is, is there provision in Jesus Christ for this? Absolutely, yes. Another way to look at this, it's it's like this. You ever seen cases, you know, or seen t things on TV, or or your own experience when you're shopping for a house, for example, or shopping for a gift for someone? And say you're going to buy a house, and the wife says to her husband, or the husband says to the wife, but the wife says to the husband, this place is perfect. Let's buy this place. This is what we're looking at. It's perfect. It's got plenty of flaws. may not be in the best neighborhood. Maybe it's got needs some little handyman work kind of thing. But in the eyes of the beholder, it's perfect. And the purchase of such a place would be make her very happy. It's in that eyes. If our inner heart is looking for perfection in an honest way, in an honest way, in an honest way, okay? You're already perfect. If the Sermon on the Mount is something that you've taken personally in your own heart, when you look at God's laws and His commandments in the right way, in which I hope we advocate here on this channel, in a healthy way. And Darren made a good point last in the last message, you know, there was a lot of those who got criticized for not making these sojourns for the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are some that have experienced maybe some abuse in that respect in terms of you need to do this because your salvation is tied to it or your blessings are tied to these kinds of things. Um, to realize uh, we are not to be burdened with that not to be burdened or be guilted into these things because nobody truly keeps them nobody truly keeps them and makes the sojourns as commanded by the Israelites we practice our interpretation to the best of our ability in a lot of our circumstances we just can't and a lot of people have been criticized for that and I've been guilty of that too maybe criticizing that's not what this faith is about. It's not what this faith is about. But if you are pursuing what Christ teaches, I've taken them to heart, you're already perfect. It's a wonderful thing in the eyes of the beholder who is the Father in heaven, because Christ said so. You're just becoming more perfect. God has accepted you already. We're not trying to become more accepted. We're trying to maintain that that exception, or that sorry, that acceptance. <laughs> excuse me, by works of the law. As Paul said in Colossians chapter two, verse nine, ten. And this, what he says here, 
And these words off practically saved my life in a lot of respects, saved my faith. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. For you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Don't be deceived by all this extraneous stuff in the context that this was given. We're just asked to grow in that standing, grow in grace and knowledge in that in that standing. You know, perhaps Jude helps us a little better here, if I can conclude with this. And that you know, perfection comes in various various ways. You know, we're gonna go to Jude. But I was thinking some for some reason of a proverb, and I don't think I found the right exactly the right one. But it says here in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, because I talked about we need to be forgiving one another. Because a lot of, there's a lot of things, we step on each other's toes and we do things, and, and then we amplify the problems. And then we try to assign someone's motivation and intent to it when we shouldn't be, because we're just not, we're going with limited information. In Proverbs 19, verse 11, it says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. It's something I've never forgotten. I think it also talks about the glory of a king is to overlook a transgression. He's got the power to destroy, but I'm going to overlook this. And that's a very important aspect of who we are, and that's what Jesus Christ advocated, and so did the disciples of forgiveness and overlooking transgressions. And who are we to make the exception? And if we want to, in our hearts of hearts, desire the things we want to do, you know, desire perfection, God is asking us, when Jesus Christ is talking about, we need to take these kinds of things to heart. Take the planks out of our own eye, because the reason why I think about this just now is because it was Saturday, yesterday morning, I was on a Bible study and was talking about, you know, judging just earlier scriptures to this, I think in Matthew chapter 5. Judge not, and take the plank out of your own eye. Something we need to, to manage. But, as I said, let's go to Jude, and I want to go to his conclusions, his positive conclusions. I told you we're going to go somewhere positive. <laughs> we want to be positive. Let's pick it up here in verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What is he talking about here? The same things. <laughs> for if you love those who love yourself, what reward of you? He says... Love those who don't love you. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who do evil to you. Who spitefully use you. Because that's the God's character. Looking at the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who can I forgive? How do I overlook this? How can I be better? And some having compassion, making a distinction. But others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Now to you, to, to, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, what? He will present you faultless. This is the job that he's working with you. But he to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy for his pleasure. Because that's what he wants. To present. To have his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He will present you faultless and perfect. But because Jesus Christ says you are, and that's all the Father 
needs to hear. No questions asked. Because you're love, brethren, and you're of much value. And that's a lot of reasons, lots of reasons, not to be spooked. Okay, brethren, I think I went a little longer than I, I hoped. Um, so, um, God bless all of you. I'm going to sign off now and you know process thing and this this video and and put it all together. So, thank you for joining us here on Shepherd's Voice Magazine. As always, as we close, share it with a friend if you've been blessed by it, or share it with an enemy, just like he just talked about here, and I'm sure you'll be blessed. So for that, take care, and we'll see you next time here on Shepherd's Voice Magazine.